Okay. Well, if so, then the last recording ended up with Gandhi, and it was his activism. Remember his nonviolent demonstrations? Um, you remember that, Jack? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And so I do think it's really important. I cannot believe the percentage of Americans that do not know the history of nonviolent demonstrations. Because you don't have a democracy unless you can demonstrate that you disagree. I mean, why have, why not just have a tyranny if, if people don't even want other people to make a public statement that they disagree? Um, anyway, so, so that's Gandhi inspired Martin Luther King. And of course, Martin Luther King inspired Black Lives Matter. So we're we're definitely in that tradition. There was another whole campaign for AIDS drugs at one point. There was a really slow process of developing the drugs and distributing the drugs. It was called ACT UP, I think was the name of the movement. And they went and read Martin Luther King and followed his playbook. There's even a book about that because we need to keep this tradition alive. Um, anyway, so that's what that was about. Now, today I'm gonna to start out with Gandhi's theology, um, his way of thinking about God. And it's, you know, it fits in with the themes of this class. I know that Melanie doesn't want anything to do with religion, which is fine. <laughs> like, I don't care. That's why I went into philosophy. Like you can start anywhere. I want you to start wherever you are and then see what happens. Um, and so, but this is a very broad view of religion. So, hey, um, Jack, do you think you could turn on your video? Okay, thanks. I hate looking at myself. Uh, but if I'm the only thing moving, you know, my eye will catch on to it. Uh, okay, so this is what Gandhi said about theology. Um, one thing he said, I, I think I don't have the quote, he read the Sermon on the Mount, and he thought, well, this is really cool. Uh, Westerners should try it sometime. <laughs> Christianity is really good religion. How come they don't try it? You know, try it. You'll like it. Uh, anyway, so he said what he wrote was... Uh, the word sata. So his principle for action was called satagriya, which is truth force. And so he was acting like Arjuna in the Bhagavad Gita that you just, you're bringing back good karma. You know, you are a force of the truth and you don't, you know, get your ego caught up in it. It's not about that. It's about the sacred duty if you have an opportunity to bring positive karma into the world and to rid certain aspects of negative karma then it is your duty your sacred uh work karma to do that so but you have to have truth force right you have to do it in a way that it's the truth that's driving it it's not me it's truth itself. So the everyone has a piece of the Atman for Brahman in them. And if they act out of that, if that's what motivates them, then the Atman Brahman inside of us will connect with the Atman Brahman outside. And it will just be um, in sync, right? It, the culture will be in sync with nature and the universe. So Gandhi wrote, the word satya means truth, and it derives from the verb to be. Sat also denotes God. Therefore, truth is God. God is that which is. He alone is. Nothing else I see merely through the senses can or will persist. That's very Buddhist. <laughs> Over the years, Gandhi tried to prove the existence of God. It's possible, quote, it's possible to reason out the existence of God to a limited extent, 
there's an orderliness in the universe, there's an unalterable law governing everything and every being that exists or lives. It's not a blind law. Uh, the law which governs all life is God. I do dimly perceive that while everything around me is ever changing, ever dying, there's underlying all that change, a living power that is changeless, that holds all together, that creates, dissolves, and recreates. That informing power or spirit is God. In the midst of death, life persists. In the midst of untruth, truth persists. In the midst of darkness, light persists. Hence, I gather that God is life, truth, and love. Um, okay, he never had, but suspecting the failure of this valiant, rational effort, he conceded that faith transcends reason. If we could solve all the mysteries of the universe, we would be co-equal with God. Okay, he never had a mystic experience. He never heard a voice or saw a vision or had some recognized experience of God. Um, he was not a mystic. Quote, I have no special revelation of God's will. Instead, quote, he reveals himself daily to every human being, but we shut our ears to the still small voice. Um, God, and this is his path to God. God never appears to you in person, but in action. He's on the path of action. Um, the, he heard the still small voice calling him to action. Um, let's see. Oh yeah, unafraid to die, certain that the soul never dies. He undertook a fast until death on an issue which to him was supremely religious. It concerned the untouchables. So I don't know if you know this, but he used to go on these fasts and he would fast till death, but it really forced the political leaders because if they let him die, there was going to be huge unrest, right? And so it's kind of like economic sanctions. Uh, you know, if the Russians start starving, I think there's going to be trouble. Um, but anyway, so... So he did that a number of times and it tended to work because they would concede uh, because they knew they could not let Gandhi die or the mass, there would just be a huge uprising. Um, but here's what happens. And this is on the other side of things that so great was the power of religion in India that the Brahmins established themselves as the highest caste, higher than the rulers and warriors, because they were able to give the caste gradations a guarantee of stability by hallowing them with the mantle of religion, right? They used religion to justify this entrenched class structure. They said, you are a Brahmin, or a sudra or an untouchable because of your conduct in a previous incarnation. Caste rank is thus preordained for this life and everybody has to submit. Uh, but good conduct now can bring uh, promotion uh, after death or bad conduct to, can lead you to a demotion, right? You'll be reincarnated into some lower animal. Um, so that's, that was also used with women for the reading for today, right? Why were you born a woman? Well, it was punishment or you just have a couple more incarnations to go. Always tolerant and fair-minded, Gandhi doubted that only the sacred Hindu Vedas were the revealed word of God. Why not the Bible and the Quran, right? Um, he hated rivalry between religions. I am a Christian and a Hindu and a Muslim and a Jew. Um, that made him a better Christian than most Christians. <laughs> okay, so uh, Dr. Stanley Jones said, God uses many instruments. He may have used Gandhi to Christianize unchristian Christianity, right? He reminded Christians of what Christian, Christians were supposed to be like. 
In South Africa, for a moment, he thought of becoming a Christian, but there were questions. Why, he asked the Christians who were trying to convert him, did God have only one son? If he had one, why not another? In Hinduism, there have been a number of human incarnations of the Almighty. Why can I go to heaven and attain, attain salvation only as a Christian? Was God a Christian? I do believe that in the other world, there are neither Hindus or Christians or Muslims. Um, he chided the missionaries for making Christians out of hungry in Indians who they fed and of sick Indians who they healed. It was like a business deal. If you convert, I'll give you some food. Make us better Hindus, he said. Um, he could have converted many Christians to Hinduism, but he didn't want that. He just told them to be good Christians. Now, given the way that I've taught this course, that makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? If it's the same basic virtues, like who cares what the brand name is? Does that make sense to you, Mia? Okay. So let's start with Jack. What, what was it you wanted to talk about uh, for class? Um, I thought it was interesting how you were saying that if you were born a woman, that you're being punished. And from the reading, he was talking about how if the husband beats his wife in Hinduism, it's for punishment from a previous life. Um, I thought it was it's kind of contradictory to the concept of ahimsa. The love for all beings i don't understand why why it's like that right okay oh anything else jack no ma'am okay what about you mia i mean i didn't since i can't get into google classroom i don't know about well we were supposed to exactly have read for the class but i do actually have a question about what you said earlier because i'm a little bit confused um you said I think it came from, well, actually, I think it believe, I believe you said it came from Gandhi, like being co-equal with God. What could you elaborate on that? Like, what exactly does that mean? If, okay. If, let's see. Um, oh, if we could solve all the mysteries of the universe, right? So that's where faith transcends reason. Mm -hmm. If your reason could solve all the mysteries of the universe, we'd be co-equal with God. Does that make sense? Oh, okay. I didn't realize there was like an underport of the like faith transcends reason. Got it. Okay. Um, big question though in, in all this stuff is, well, how much do you have to transcend, right? Does God kill innocent people by having some truck driver run over your kid or Right? How mysterious are we going to go? <laughs> um, and also, like, we know we're destroying life on Earth, right? We know what the biosphere is like, and we know we're destroying species and melting glaciers. Like, how much more do we need to know? <laughs> right? How mysterious does this have to be? Um, but it does transcend the way a lot of people use their reason. It trans it. You know, it's a critical of a whole lot of the way the sciences are being used. Um, that doesn't make you co-evil with God. It just makes you want to develop a sustainable culture. Does that make sense? I mean, your religion should motivate you to call out the system that's destroying the earth. But, you know, you can say it's faith. But you can say it's, no, it's reason. Or you could say it's common sense. <laughs> um, so, you know, I don't know how much you want to get into the difference between faith and reason or how transcendent, how far removed from what we know you want God to be, right? I mean, there's going to be plenty of people as the climate catastrophes increase that will say, oh, it's Armageddon. It's from the book of Revelation. And all you have to do is get saved and you don't have to worry about it. And you can still drive your gas guzzling truck 
And you can still be willing to fight wars so the gas is cheaper for your truck. You know, God's okay with that. Uh, so I, I, I think you ought to sort all that out in your head because I don't know if you talk to other people, but I think you might be totally amazed at what people convince themselves of. <laughs> and it's just going to get worse in your lifetime. It is, it's going to be really bad. Um, so, okay, so let's go to women. Um, what was the case with uh, Socrates and women, for example? Um, Socrates, let's see, here's the reading on women. And here's the outline. So Socrates, I don't think I actually talked, talked about this at the time, but he was considered kind of effeminate because he wasn't, in, he was not machismo and he did not, he wasn't interested in power. He wasn't interested in money. He wasn't interested in having sex with a lot of young women. He wasn't, and he, his teachers, the, the people he really looked up to and the people who were his teachers were women which of course was completely outrageous at the time. <laughs> so he talks about Diotima, who was a priestess at Delphi. And she told him, you know, your eros is totally screwed up, Socrates. You need to really change yourself. And um, you can tell from the way Socrates lived his life that he did, like he did what she told him to do. He started out being totally attracted to bodies, physical bodies. And she said, get over it, Socrates. What really matters is the beauty of a soul, the beauty of laws and institutions, the beauty of the order of the universe, the beauty of the fact that we can understand it, um, the beauty of people working together to create a culture that's in sync with the natural world, those are all beautiful. And you ought to get turned on by them the same, you know, instead of the stupid reacting to a body thing. And um, he did, he changed. Um, then his mother was actually a midwife. And so she delivered babies where Socrates said, I'm like an intellectual midwife because people come to me with ideas and I question them about them. And I see if it really is a baby that needs to be born or if it's just a wind egg. <laughs> it's uh, Dio, Dio, uh, what? Dead on arrival, DOA. Um, and then they should abort it if it's, um, uh, illegitimate idea, right? Anyway, so Socrates was not uh, machismo. He would be considered much more feminine. Jesus treated women like equals. I think I said that before, but the people who wrote the Bible, it was 70 years after he died, and they definitely chose which stories about his life to tell or they made them up in order to, they would tell a story about the kind of person he was and the kind of way he lived, which was what everybody at that time did. You never asked, did, were you there? Did you actually see it? it <laughs> so there's a story about him in the home of Mary and Martha. I, did I tell you that story? Really? Okay, because I don't want to repeat myself. Um, plus, my name is Martha, and my dad was a preacher. And so I know that I grew up with this story in the back of my mind, because um, I do not care about cooking. I do not cook. And it's not a matter of principle. It's just that I stopped, like the button went off, turned off a long time ago. So he's at their house, and he was close friends with women. 
and he talked about serious things with them. So they were disciples, basically, but they weren't one of the 12 for obvious reasons. You can't have a single woman roaming around the countryside with single men. You know, it's just not workable. They'd end up getting stoned or something. But, but you know, the gospel writer included that story because he wants people to know Jesus treated women as equals. Um, so he's at the home of Mary and Martha, and Mary is in the living room talking to Jesus about philosophy or spirituality or whatever, and the movement. Um, or it was, it was a reformist movement. Jesus wanted the Jews to really get back to what Judaism was really about. And religious traditions have reform movements all the time. Anyway, Martha was in the kitchen and she was preparing the meal and she got really annoyed with Mary and said, you, should, you need to come in and help me in the kitchen. And Jesus said, no, Mary has the better part. And so what he's saying is, don't spend your life in the kitchen. <laughs> Come into the living room, be serious. So the story is that Jesus treated women as equals. And of course, that never, that is not the overall way people practice their Christianity. They quote from Paul or they quote from the Old Testament. But <laughs> I mean, don't you take Jesus? If you're Christian, you would definitely take Jesus' word first. And if these other people contradict it, you'd say, no, I'll go with Jesus because I'm a Christian. So I, I do not understand at all how sexism can be justified in Christianity. Um, then, uh, so Hinduism, right? Think about the the theology, the view of reality, is that there's this kind of energy in the universe. Energy does not have a penis or a vagina, right? Energy is not sexed. And then um, the Brahma, there's the three main gods, Vishnu, Brahma, and Shiva. Each of them has a female cohort. So the image in your head should be of this balancing of animus and anima or yin and yang because energy is all about balancing, right? And it's about karma. It's about uh, getting to this place where there's a overall good karma. Well, what they did, right? When a religion gets institutionalized, it starts worshiping the culture more than the spirit. Every one of them does that. Christianity did that. Judaism did that. So the spiritual origin of the religion, living for the sake of something greater than yourself, has all of a sudden become a tool of the institutions and of power and wealth. And that's what happens. I just read about how the Brahmins told people that the reason there is this caste system is because of their previous lives, right? So you use religion to gloss over, you completely kill the spiritual life. All of a sudden, it doesn't matter if you actually live for the sake of something greater than yourself, or if you don't, you're just stuck. And so, um, so that happened in... Um, it happened in Christianity and it happened in Hinduism. So what happened is years after Hinduism developed slowly, but years later, this code of Manu emerged and it was completely written by those corrupt Brahmins who were using their power to justify a more and more centralized power. So they claimed, right? that instead of the spiritual life having this balance of yin and yang and animus and anima, and then either one of them can fall into bad karma or good karma, but the best karma is when they're, they energize each other. Instead of that, 
it was that male energy is good karma and female energy is 100% bad karma, right? You're born a female because as punishment because you did something bad or you're just an underdeveloped soul. And if you behave yourself next time, you can be a man. Oh boy, I can't wait. Anyway, so um, they had all that subservience, obedience, surveillance. Um, but there are obviously less sexist ways to read this. Um, let's see. Okay, so even Muhammad, and we're going to get that, get to that, because obviously the Taliban, and we have these stereotypes that are legitimate. I mean, in the Wahhabi Muslims, the Taliban, they are completely uh, horrible toward women. But Muhammad, and they use the Quran, but if you look at Muhammad and you look at the context, he was way ahead of his time uh, in terms of equal treatment of women. So we'll look at that later. Um, I'm really glad that I know that because, I mean, the behavior toward women in the name of Islam is a fact, but it, it, the, the corruption of the religion, if you read, really read what went on and how Muhammad treated women, it's complete misreading. Um, all right, so, um, all right, so there is a, a book that, um, justifies unequal treatment. And Gandhi himself had women issues. He was married at age 13 and he started dominating his wife at a young, right then, and not letting her go outside and all sorts of stuff. And they never really did get along that well. When he's trying to break down the caste system, he insisted that she and he clean chamber pots and she did not want to clean chamber pots. <laughs> she made it publicly clear that this was very annoying to her. Um, and then he also used to hang, you know, have two virgins at each side of him to test, you know, his moral fortitude. <laughs> and so when you see there have been some clips or else somebody there's in the movie there were people have described exactly the situation when uh gandhi got murdered and he came out of a tent he had been meditating or something and he has these two young women on his side at his side <laughs> and then somebody comes and shoots them right in the stomach or something um and it was a Hindu, so you do need to know that, that it wasn't a Muslim and it wasn't a foreigner, it wasn't a British person. Among Hindus, there was a huge disagreement uh, between the people who wanted the elite to take over after the British left and to govern because they felt like those, you know, those uneducated masses are not capable of it. And we want India to progress. Whereas Gandhi was a great defender of the villagers and the masses. And he didn't prioritize that India would go high tech and that India would compete with the West for all this sophistication and money and power. So he got shot by somebody who just thought he was holding India back. Um, and I, I think that's interesting. And that happens. Um, that's a common pattern in human affairs. How to lead a household life. Um, it's all very, right? It's very sexist. There's other patterns in the way sexism plays out in religions. And one of them is this obsession with purification. So if you wanna purify your mind, right? 
it's women that are the temptress. We have that in we have that in Christianity, right? Eve is the temptress. It was all her fault. Evil was her fault because she seduced Adam into eating the apple and all this crap. So, um, <clears throat> so let's see. The death and burial service is particularly egregious, where um, the bodies are always cremated, and then the ashes are spread in the Ga Ganges River often because that's a sacred river. But the widow is supposed to jump into the fire and die with her husband. Um, so that's, it's illegal now. I'm not quite sure if, if people actually even do it anymore because it's so visible. Um, there's other really horrible sexist things that go on. One of them is uh, house fires where um, the dowry, I think, I think that's later on in this article is about dowry. So I'll wait on that in a minute. Um, the idea, the religious view that if you have a son, he will light the fire and you will be able to, to be liberated. But if you don't have a son, you're in trouble, right? Because when you die, then you won't be able to get the sacred ritual. <laughs> which is a the, to me that's obviously religion has gone over the line and there's no evidence it's totally made up it's clearly in somebody's interest clearly any sort of religious belief or ritual that clearly harms a person uh, you should be suspicious about um all right so sanskritization where women are sent home um, to protect them from the evil world and um, supposedly in religious, for religious reasons. And so you deny them education, which makes it impossible for them to function in the public world, have any sort of power or money or status or anything like home is it. And then you get you marry them off at a very young age. Um, so women just have no life at all. Um, and then there was that list of the duties of a respected Hindu wife. Um, and, and the irony is that the one, right, the Brahmin does not have gender, that religion is about interior knowledge, right? And that's not um the the various forms are male and female but there's but there's all types right there isn't the forms that the 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 brahmin takes when people say i apologize because i'm making you into a person and i know you're not a person but they have all those you know symbols and gods and goddesses, but it's gods and goddesses. It's not just gods and symbols that are genderless. There's no reason. There's no reason for the sexism other than power and wealth. Um, okay, so um, polytheism should lend itself to being the least sexist. Do you understand why he says that? I'll ask you that when I stop talking. Um, well, let me quit right here at, at Kali. And um, I want you to just respond. Does it make sense to you when he says polytheism should actually, it's a no brainer. It, should be, it shouldn't be sexist because it's all about energy. Women and girls are pieces of the Atman, animals, are pieces of the Atma. Like, what is this? Um, let's see. So Western societies um, uh, are against idolatry. So it's a kind of idolatry to make this energy into some sort of person of idol, right? And they're against that. So why do they insist on maleness? It, um, Okay, so 
let me see. Let me stop for a minute and just see if you have any reactions so far, that far into the article. Anything else, Jack? Um, I think, um, yeah, I don't think polytheism should be sexist because the goddesses, I don't know. I think there's something else going on there. Like, a, because if there's goddesses, I mean, they're on the same level as a, a as a god, I guess. So, if you pray to them. Yeah. So, I mean, I guess that's just, that has to be a cultural thing. Okay. So what you what you want to get is the pattern, right? So the pattern is the way religion goes from spiritual to institutional, and then it starts getting controlled by power and money, right? By the, the class of people. So all of a sudden it becomes a way to justify class, entrenched class structures. Does that make sense? Yes, ma'am. And that is anti-spiritual. If there's anything anti-spiritual, it's that. Yeah. Okay. Um, what about you, Mia? No, oh, I was going to say the same thing about polytheism. Like in, in theory, yeah, I think it should be less sexist. But like you said, it's a cultural thing. It's all about patterns. It's like the way that people are does is the way that kind of people have been, I guess, and the way that things are yeah kind of makes it to where it it's essentially impossible for, well well not impossible but you know what I mean like it, it it cannot it makes that not true so yes and no it's a yes and no question I think in so theory yes. in your little town in Texas do people think that women shouldn't hold leadership positions in church so okay it's, yes and no so i i'm a method i like i'm a part of a methodist oh. church and okay. we have what's called the 11th hour but the 11th hour in the 11th hour we do have a female preacher pastor whatever i don't actually know the difference between the two but um she is the head of that service however like going to that service is incredibly frowned upon because it's the, the people that go there are like the guys who are like completely covered in tattoos, like the biker gangs, they're the people who are homosexuals. So like, yeah, there are female preachers there, but it is very, very humiliating to go to serve, like hu humiliating, you know what I mean? In quotes, um, to go to ser that service or services that they lead. And she gets a lot of criticism too, because uh, like, when, oh, I don't remember what exactly the sermon was. I just remember that there was a big, big issue where like they were saying that whatever she was preaching did not align with the Bible. When she directly quoted it, she, it wasn't like she took it out of context or anything. Like, I, I don't know, I'm for her, but yeah, is it, the, it happens, but it, it's frowned upon. Okay, so let me, I, I grew up Methodist. And when I moved back here, I joined a Methodist church. Did I tell you this? Uh, no, ma'am. Okay, well, it's kind of interesting. I graduated from a small liberal arts school that was Methodist. Um, I went to another liberal school. And after a couple of years, I just, it was too far to the left. So I transferred back. Um, this was a school my dad went to, which, eek, you know. You kind of want to be your own person. Um, but anyway, and I had a really good teacher. He was also a Methodist preacher's kid who turned to Greek philosophy because in the Methodist church, you need to know this, Mia, there's, there, is, there were scholars who analyzed John Wesley's sermons. And you yourself can go right online, John Wesley's sermons, and then reason and faith. Go ahead and do it. I mean, there'll be about 12 and that'll come up. And it's so obvious, like he talks about John Locke and he was, he was educated at Oxford. And so the four, they have this quadrilateral, which is four themes that run in Methodism. One is the union of reason and faith. Oh, 
and scriptures and tradition and experience. And so everyone is supposed to meet every week in a small group. And then they're supposed to talk about, well, what happened this week in, um, you know, in the news or in your experience and which Bible quote would you think is relevant and how do you tie reason and faith and how did people in the past do this? So it's a constant activity. Like there's no one size fits all at all, right? From one week to the next. So John Wesley said, work out your own salvation with diligence, right? Take it seriously. But he said, if your heart is as my heart, um, take my hand. So he was anti-doctrinal, but he was pro-intellectual, right? You needed to use your reason. And so the Methodist Church actually ordained women like in 1905, way before the Lutherans, Episcopals, whatever, because John Wesley was a social justice kind of guy. He went and prayed with people who were getting hung, poor people are getting hung for stealing a loaf of bread. He was very critical of the system because of the class structure. So in general, you have a lot of social activist types at a Methodist church. My dad marched in Selma and he was supported by the church. Um, and the church supported the ecumenical interfaith movement, civil rights movement, environmental movement. Um, so I just want to explain to you that um, this is that woman knows what she's doing. Um, and there's also a big split right now in the Methodist church over the gay issue. But my argument is that John Wesley would follow the science right? The tradition is that he would follow the science. Um, what happened was when Methodists came over to the U.S., these preachers were not educated as much, right? Because um, there wasn't access. So, so it, it became less intellectual than it was at the beginning. Anyway, that's, that's enough. But um, it's an interesting story, though. Because what I've noticed is Methodists in the South, they are the most liberal of the, of the churches that have a church in a town. Is that, is that do you think that's true? Um, I think maybe in terms of denomination, but like I'm also a member of a non-denominational church. I think that kind of may not be as true for that church. Well, what about the union of reason and faith, though? I mean, that non-denominational is funded by Baptist churches. And I know, I just think it allows you to be anywhere on the map with all that stuff. It doesn't really hold your feet to the fire about reason and faith. What do you uh, think, Mia? I mean, I think I, I think I agree. I, I don't know it's something i actually have to ponder for a while i don't know it's okay. interesting i mean compass you know i mean there's an idea of having a moral compass but gosh you need to link that to education you know like tradition reason and faith scripture i mean you gotta get educated and it just seems like I, I just get suspicious when you don't have to tie stuff down and you don't have to have some kind of systematic way of accounting for, you know, God talked to me yesterday. You know? <laughs> yeah, well, why'd you skip the middleman there? It's really about you. Right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think God is telling me, blah, blah. Really? It seems, it seems to me like that's your personality. That's what you would say if there weren't any God. <laughs> uh, I get suspicious. Um, so Melanie, first of all, welcome. And I hope you got some supper. Um, what did you want to talk about? I'm going to be honest with you, Dr. Mac. I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't have anything right now. Are you um, tired? Are you tired? Yeah, I don't know. Is it yeah, I'm just overwhelmed. <laughs> 
I mean, is it a combination? Like I'm not, e I'm not even home. Oh, okay. I'm still at softball stuff. Really? So uh -huh. did they let you have supper and now you're back at softball stuff? Yeah, I had to go um, straight to get food after practice. And now we're, we're at a team talk. So even when you have, a I had to come out in the hallway. So they told huh? you to skip class. They told you to skip no, class. No, they didn't tell me to skip class. I just, I'm just, I'm just now being able to log in. Well, I mean, okay. So I don't think you have problem. Yeah, yeah. You've your attendance has been really good, so it's not going to be like. Anyway, so I'll just call you present. I know that you come when you can. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, I it's just okay. wasn't, it's just, I wasn't oh, prepared. I and um, so I made a recording of this. So I think that you'll be able okay. to follow everything. Um, yeah, if you want, I can um, I can meet with you tomorrow night or something and make up this class and talk with you about the readings. Sure, if you'd like to. I mean, I just. I feel bad because I know you're excited about it and then you never get to have any sort of continuity of thought. Um, yeah. Okay, well, that would be great. I mean, I'll put you down here. Uh, oh, actually, I'm going to a play okay. about Thurgood Marshall. Okay. At an African-American um, playhouse. It's a cool place, but I'll be back. So I could meet at, uh, what time do you go to bed? I mean, I'll be back home probably at least by 10. Um, yeah, I should still be up then to log in. Okay. Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> all right. It's just, I'm, I mean, I live in this place where there was uh, this African American guy started a playhouse years ago, you know, when it was really cutting edge and it was really a risk. And it has survived, and uh, it's really nice. Um, there is this, I can't remember, there's an organization that he started that has a combination of uh, uh, mental health and the arts and um, education, all sorts of stuff. It's just kind of a center. And um, Mackenzie Scott, uh, Bezos's ex, gave them five million bucks recently. And so they're just cool. I mean, I live in a place now where I can go to these things. Ah, I'm so happy. <laughs> I mean, if you guys were here, I'd pay for you to come with me, you know. It's a play about Thurgood Marshall and it was written by a living playwright. And I don't know. I just wish my students had more exposure. I just do think they would love it and they would know. This is what democracy is about, you know? But anyway, so I did take a moment to explain that because I want that for you. I want my students to at least spend a few years where they are in a place where all this stuff is going on and what it's like, um, you know? and. And then they go back home, that's great. It's just, I think most of my students that like philosophy really want to check out other stuff. Um, anyway, so we're back on to the way that religion. So right now in history, religion is getting made into a weapon to hurt, you know, to get people pitted against each other within a country and between countries. But we, you know, if you read, religion has been a weaponized before. Like weaponizing religion is an old <laughs> problem, especially with sexism. It's it's used as a tool to keep women down. And it's if you're really good at women accept it, uh, which is really annoying. Um, so the doctrine of nonviolence. Um, was uh, never became the norm. It should have been, never got institutionalized into practice. There's personal nonviolence versus structural. You can, you know, 
there are ways that the system itself is racist or sexist. And no one person has to have any sort of racist or sexist opinions or emotions. They just judge based on the law and the law doesn't account for women or, or non-whites. So there's that is a huge problem. Institutionalized racism, institutionalized sexism. Um, and then the dowry issue. So we have, we just have a couple minutes, but this happens actually. My students at AUW talk about this. Dowry is a big deal. So people pay, you know, to, to they buy other people's daughters. Um, but, you know, they don't say, uh, give me X amount, but uh, they do, you know, say, look, I'm a middle, middle class guy and I, I'm attracted to your daughter and I could give her a decent life. And so the parents, you know, <laughs> give her away. They, they don't, they can't afford to keep her. Once she gets there, she has to take care of his parent, his whole family like a slave. Okay, so that happens a lot in Bangladesh. But this one is about how the daughter is sold uh, for a dowry. Like if you have a daughter, you got to spend your life saving money so you have a big enough dowry so you can actually sell your daughter. Well, then the parents of the son or the son decide that wasn't enough. So they'll demand more from the, from the bride's family. And if the bride's family says no, then there are these kitchen fires where, gee, she, she died in the kitchen because I guess a fire must have erupted in the pan, you know? And basically they're killing her for money. Um, then there's abortion in India. 90% um, of the abortions are female. Um, so there's this huge, there's millions of uh, what would have been girls are, are dead every year throughout the world um, because they're not boys, because of all the cultural and economic advantages to having a boy and disadvantages to having a girl. So it's institutionalized. Poor people are almost driven into that force. So it's better to get uh, tested for what kind of a fetus you have and get rid of it than it is you know, to have to deal with the dowry situations. Um, let's see, um, wait, how do you overturn the tradition? Um, and then make sure the daughters don't move too far away so that if they're abused, they can get back home. Uh, the notion that women are polluted during menstruation. Okay, I have, I have students from Nepal and I don't think they had to do this, but their mothers did and their grandmothers did. While they're menstruating, they have to go live in this little hut next to the house because they're unclean. And actually some of the students I have at AUW, while they're menstruating, they can't touch things. They can't go in the kitchen and touch uh, dishes or anything. <laughs> and it really is male fear, you know, because that's their power to re reproduce. So, of course, you would definitely demonize that, you know, and women accept it. Um, so, the solution is education. Um, there's two di different kinds of sacred texts the kind you've internalized, and then the kind on paper. That's true of every religion. Um, okay, all right. Then there was, yeah, there's areas. So it is changing fast. But so what I wanna teach you is first of all, where it's been, because it's been in some pretty awful places. And once you get straight where it's been, then, it's also true that it's changing fast. And Melinda Gates, the moment of lift is um, telling how she's contributing money to promote this changing view of women. And then at AUW, those women are really gonna make a different world. Um, and I just, I just hope Lion students 
would be motivated. They don't seem motivated. They seem like they don't think it's a problem. And the trouble is, it is a problem. Um, it gets to be a problem when you get married and you have kids and you're trying to juggle family and career. And, and that's really difficult in the US still. And Melinda Trump, if you want to read her book, she talks about her own difficulties. She was actually in an abusive relationship. You don't think of that, you know. Bill met her at Microsoft because she was an up and coming bright uh, employee. At one point, she was a manager of a lot. There were a lot of people under her. So that's all, you know, that's all I would hear about her. She's really smart. She's really successful. Um, but no, you know, the story is she's been through a lot. And recently she divorced Bill or they got divorced. I guess I don't know. And so that's a whole nother chapter. And that's going to take, you know, it's, but it, it's an interesting story. She wrote it partly to show people that like she's a woman too and she's had a lot of the same experiences although you know in a privileged setting but emotionally you know people get in abusive relationships no matter how much privilege they have they emotionally somebody can really sort of gaslight you right or mansplain you and make you feel like you're stupid or ugly or lazy or whatever so anyway um next time we'll finish up on what we didn't cover today and then i'll post some other stuff we're going to do the environment which should be a no-brainer hinduism and the environment hinduism and art um and what else there was some other stuff but we'll close up on hinduism next time um, paper topics, you can write now on Confucianism or Hinduism for your third paper if you want to get that out of the way. And I'll see you in another five days. Take care and I'll see you tomorrow, Melanie, maybe at 10. Yes. Mia, yeah, you can come again for any time you want, you know, in the evening, Thursday, okay. Friday, or Saturday. You should email me if you're going to because sometimes I just get lazy because nobody ever comes on. But I definitely will. Uh, I'll email you tomorrow, Dr. Beck, and remind you about to, about our Zoom tomorrow. <laughs> and we can talk about everything. Thank you, Melanie. That's great. Uh, okay, Mia. So, yeah, you can email me about whether you worked it out with Jeremy. Yes, ma'am. And whatever, wherever you're at. Um, okay, yeah, I should... I'm praying everything's there, but I actually have a question for you really quickly. That's not related to that. I recently changed my major. I want to be an RPH major now, oh. but yes, ma'am. I, I, Christy asked me to, she recommended that I talk to you about it first, but I just really wanted to make the decision then and there because there was like a deadline and I just really made it then. Um, but I was wondering, is there because I know that you're not necessarily on campus, so I assume that you can't take advisees, but is there someone that you can rec like is there someone that you recommend that I talk to or sure? Well, John Becker, Dr. Becker is the one who took my place. So okay. um, what other RPH classes have you had? Uh so far just Christian theology, but in next semester I'm signed up to take um Oh my gosh, my brain just broke. Uh, I'm signed up to take something with Dr. Beebe, ethics with Dr. Beebe, I believe, and then uh, Old Testament and something else that I don't remember because I just recently had to switch it, but I don't remember what it was. I know I'm taking three classes of it next semester, though. Okay. I mean, I'm going to teach about Greek culture if you want to, the legacy of ancient Greece. Um, but Let's see, do you have to change your mate, your uh, advisor right now or can you wait one semester? I can probably wait one semester. That's what Chris was saying. Um, I wasn't 100% sure. She told me to talk to you about it, see what you thought, so. Well, what you should do is if you're taking classes from Mr. Beauty, you can know after a month or a few weeks, you probably know, yeah, I, I can 
he could be my advisor. You know, he's he's okay. a good guy. It's just that you would just know, <laughs> you know, if you waited another month or so, waited till the fall. Um, but I'm sure both of them would be fine. I don't take advisees anymore because I don't, I never was good at keeping up with all those requirements because they're not systematic. You just have to memorize them. And I'm terrible at that. But, um, and now, you know, I'm just too far out of touch. Um, but anyway, they, they have to keep up on it. It's part of the job. And I did it when I had to, but okay. So Mia, like that's exciting to me. And given your background and given what you just said, I mean, did, was it helpful what I said in response? Like there's yes. a whole history there. Yes, ma'am. So the thought process with the whole change and everything too was, I'm really passionate about like, I don't know, this is gonna sound like cheesy, but I like wanna be able to make change like for myself. That's not right. cheesy. Like you're going to have to, either you're going to make it or it's going to make you but there's right. not going to be any sitting around yes ma'am and so right now i don't know i'm kind of in a slump but the original plan i wanted to pursue law and i thought it would be interesting i could have like a different take going into law school if i wasn't just a poli sci major like everyone else was kind of around me applying was going to be and so I thought that could really help too. And also I just enjoy taking class, so. All right, so philosophy is a very good pre-law major. And there are a lot of RPH majors that go into uh, law. And um, especially there's a lot in the rest of the country, um, philosophy in general, that's the most common next step for philosophy majors is um law so 